This podcast is brought to you by Podcast Nation. You are listening to As a Woman, Episode 93, Secondary Infertility, with Dr. Flora Senha. Flora is a friend of mine. She's a fellow doctor mom. She had the shock of secondary infertility and has gone through IVF, only to decide that it's not the right time in their journey. Welcome to As a Woman, the podcast hosted by fertility physician, Dr. Natalie Crawford, to educate and empower women. Each week, learn about your health, your fertility, and how they relate to your true self. Become a part of the community, fostering collaboration over competition, while learning how to authentically find your voice and amplify others as a woman. Hey, friends. Welcome back to the As a Woman podcast. I am so happy to have you here. I just want to say, as we are rounding out 2020, this is the last As Woman podcast episode for 2020. Oh, what a year it has been. This journey for me starting this podcast, I started it two years ago, right around my birthday, which is in January. So I have my two-year anniversary coming up, and I am constantly floored and shocked by the reach this podcast has had and how many of you it has been able to touch. We are getting close to a million downloads, which will be a huge milestone that we will celebrate, celebrate. And every single one of you made it happen. It's very humbling. It is very inspiring. And I just love you all so much. I'm so excited to have this guest today. So Flora and I have been friends. She is an internal medicine physician and she got pregnant with her first baby, no problem. She then had secondary infertility, which we're going to talk about, which is when you don't have problems conceiving initially, but then with a subsequent child, you have infertility. And she had what we commonly find is secondary unexplained infertility. She's a board certified internist living in Southern California. She has a beautiful five-year-old named Gia. She is married to a physician. And she talks about what it's like culturally as a South Asian going through infertility and dealing with this journey. She is taking her story to Instagram and social media, of which I am so proud. I am honored to know her and so happy to have her here today. Okay, I am so, so excited and honored. Flora, thank you for being here. And what I want to start with is just by having you actually share your journey in medicine before we get to any of your fertility journey. So did you always know you want to be a doctor? And how did you kind of get into the life of internal medicine and what you do now? So first and foremost, thanks for having me. Um, Secondly, yeah, I actually went into college not wanting to do medicine. Um, My parents had maybe mentioned it and I went the opposite direction, but slowly, I know I started as a business major and clearly was not good at it. So here (laughs) I am. (laughs) And so, um, yeah, I uh, met my husband in college and um, so we're college sweethearts. And at that time he was for sure, like he wanted to be a doctor. That was his end goal. I still really, the thing that confirmed my decision to go into medicine um, was I, I had volunteered in Africa um, doing HIV and AIDS work. And um, just my work there really confirmed my decision to go into medicine. Then in med school, I mean, we're thrown into so many different scenarios, our third and fourth years it's during rotation. Crazy. It, it really is. It's very overwhelming. And actually, my first choice was to go into reproductive endocrinology. Hi, um, look at that. I... I shadowed a bunch of people my second and third year, and I, I had my mindset. And then I did my ob rotation, and I'm like, huh, I don't think I'm cut out to be a surgeon. And I kind of backtracked, and, and my last rotation was internal medicine, and I loved it. I loved kind of knowing a little bit about everything. Um, and yeah, fast forward all of that time. And here I am as an outpatient internist. And I, I, I love my job. I love making connections with my patients and just that continuity of care. Uh, I take care of everyone in their family. It's really nice. It's such a nice job. I think it's there's this hard part when you go through medical training that you have to pick something that is like super unique or like really mm-hmm. random or special. And I don't know why. I think it's because we're all bred to be really competitive in this nature. Yes. But I... Th- I loved internal medicine too. I had a, obviously I picked emergency medicine and then I switched. So that mm-hmm. idea of being yeah. able to help anybody who walks through the door and know something that could be of benefit to almost anybody in your life. That's a, that's something very, very valuable. 
One thing I want to ask is because I know when I was in medical school, I distinctly remember sitting at the Starbucks with two of my girlfriends and we were studying or supposed to be studying, but instead we were trying to decide like, what field should we go into? And I like this, but Mm -hmm. surgery. And what about the lifestyle of a surgeon? And when would I have kids? Mm -hmm. And we would have this talk because this was way before the days of you could go freeze your eggs. And everybody Mm -hmm. was talking about, well, if I pick this path, so if I'm going to be an REI, I'll have to do four years OBGYN and three years of REI. And then I won't be done with my training until I'm 34. And did you have those talks too in medical school or did you think about this at Um, all? Absolutely. I am um, South Asian. So it is a routine conversation in our family. The aunties, right? I hear about the aunties. Oh my gosh. All the aunties, all of the aunties of the aunties, they they are, it's constant. When are you, first of all, um, you got to be a doctor. So you got to go to school for a million years, train for a million years. Oh, by the way, you got to be the perfect wife, the perfect mom. And you also have to just do it all. So that timeline plus that ideal picture of what a family is supposed to look like, I was, I was brought and bred up with that. So it was... It, it was interesting because those conversations were were on the top of my list almost at all times. So when I was trying to figure out what I wanted to go into, um, my husband, my um, my dad is a physician, and I would kind of bounce ideas off with him, like, "Hey, what about REI? What about GI? What about you know?" There's so many different ways I could have gone, and it always ended with, "Well, are you going to have time for your husband and your kids?" Mm, oh and my, my husband, who is a interventional pediatric cardiologist, meaning lots of training and lots of unpredictable hours, never once got that question or got that that feedback. And so in short, yeah, it, it was a constant source of, of information conversation. And honestly, I didn't I picked internal medicine for one of those reasons. Um, I don't think I, I fell into internal medicine as a default, but, um, you know, it was one of my priorities. I did want some flexibility given that my husband was going to have this very unpredictable schedule. Yeah. It's funny how we almost get subconsciously biased by this because I really do think Mm -hmm. I would never have told anybody I picked emergency medicine because I had a shorter training pathway. Maybe I could start my family sooner and I had more flexibility with a schedule, at least a perceived flexibility. I, but that was obviously underlying and part of why I felt drawn to that path because I knew I wanted to be a mom and my whole other world was saying, that's going to be, you can't do that and do medicine without messing one of them up, right? That's the conversation is you can't do both of them good. Something's going to suffer. Your kids are going to suffer or your career is going to suffer. And so I think that this is really pervasive and women don't feel women in medicine that they can talk about it enough and have an honest Mm -hmm. conversation what does it look like? When can I have, tra- can I have kids in my training program? What does that mean? It, there's goods and bads about that. I definitely feel like my own personal journey to starting our family was delayed because of being in medicine for sure. And mm-hmm. I have other friends who had kids in training, you know, in residency, I had mine in fellowship, which was easier, but I honestly don't know that I, I could have in residency. My residency was so intense. I barely, I mean, it was so intense and I learned a ton and I wouldn't do it any way differently, but props to the people who are having kids in the midst of this really unreasonable mm-hmm. work schedule, the demands, the learning curve. So I think it's sometimes unrealistic for us to tell people, yeah, you can have kids then and not act like it's going to be tough, right? Because I think you can, but for me personally, when I looked at it and, and my husband, knew, we said, we're not going to try till we get to the end of this mm-hmm. because this training program is too hard. And that was a conscious choice at that time period. But I find that we're just delaying this conversation until we're ready for Mm -hmm. most people. I keep hoping the tide is turning for younger women in medicine, but I keep hearing that it's really not. It's still something that very often people aren't talking about, at least on the whole. I do know there's some family-friendly programs, but how how was yours? When did you decide to start trying for GIA? How did that figure into things and how did that journey go? 
Yeah, we were along the same lines as as you guys were um, during. We were both in residency at the same time. Unreasonable hours, and um, I I, ha- I went through depression and anxiety during my residency program. So there was no way I had the mindset to to truly take care of a human being oh. um, along with myself. And my husband, you know, we were just, it was just way too unpredictable. So we also consciously made the decision um, to to delay trying till after I was done with residency. My husband went on to fellowship. Um, and honestly, I didn't think about infertility. It, it, you know, all the, all the typical reasons it didn't run in my family. I had normal menstrual cycles. I never had issues. Um, I, I just thought, hey, I'm still in my 20s or I will be in my early 30s when I try and it'll be fine. And you know what? It was. I conceived Gia within maybe two to three months of stopping my birth control, almost to the point where when I was two weeks late, I... (laughs) I was in denial. I'm like, there's no way it could happen that fast. Oh, it didn't happen that fast. (laughs) Right? It almost happened. We're such planners. I'm I'm projecting here, but we're such planners that I presume it's like, well, it's going to take a few months. So I'm going to stop my birth control. And then this is the first month I really want it to happen. And then you conceive her so quickly, uh, which is a blessing. How was that pregnancy with her? Um, the preg- the pregnancy was very difficult. I um about four, no, about five weeks gestation. So basically like two days after I found out I was pregnant, um, I thought I had miscarried. I, I had a a tremendous amount of bleeding um to the point where I, I had convinced myself I had miscarried. And then maybe one to two weeks in, I continued to feel ill. I was incredibly fatigued, um, nauseous, not eating, losing weight. Um, my husband took me to the hospital. They did a pregnancy test. And I, in my head, I was like, this is an ectopic pregnancy. There's no way there's anything left. We get in for an ultrasound and lo, lo and behold, I see this little, little pitter patter in my uterus. Oh, and, and we both were just like, this is, this is for real. I had a, a, a very large subchorionic hemorrhage. So I bled for the first maybe six and a half months of my pregnancy. Oh my God. That's terrible. Um, that's just terrifying. Yeah. Every it, single every time. time I would see spotting, I'm like, okay, this is it. This is it. I'm losing the baby. And it was just, and on top of that, I had hyperemesis gravidum. It, it was a rough pregnancy. Um, it ended with me delivering six weeks early. So Gia was in the NICU for two weeks. Um, and knock on wood, she's perfectly fine, healthy, beautiful, strong little soul that challenges us at every moment. (laughs) But um, she's doing great. But yeah, it it was a difficult pregnancy and delivery. One thing I was surprised about, so similarly, I I did not love being pregnant. I was definitely not a pregnancy unicorn. I have some patients who they get pregnant and they're like, my skin is glowing and life is great. And I was like falling asleep hungry all the time, really mad, really tired, (laughs) felt nauseous, but hungry, you know, it's just, I was a mess. It was a lot harder for me to be pregnant and be a doctor than I was ready. And I'm sure that's anybody who's just working, a working person who is pregnant. Mm -hmm. I was not prepared for like the extreme fatigue and for Mm -hmm. just, I mean, I remember how bizarre it would be to be in the operating room. I have a long case, maybe I'm taking fibroids out. And then like the baby would start kicking and it's like, you're in this zone. And then suddenly you're like, oh my God, there's some, and you're like, oh, it's the baby. It's this crazy thing. So I found it actually really tough for me being a doctor and balancing Mm -hmm. like how I felt with pregnancy. And then of course, balancing all the demands of being a new mom. I was 1000% unprepared for how hard breastfeeding would be, the sleep Mm -hmm. deprivation, but like having to go back to work a few weeks later and act like life was normal. Like people act like you didn't just have a baby. You had to like look great, go in rooms, be happy, even though you slept a couple hours. So I was very unprepared for how that side of the journey would be. And I think because a lot of social media or just glamorizes Mm -hmm. pregnancy and having a newborn. And so Mm -hmm. I felt like the outlier here trying to do this job that had meant a lot to me and still did. And function as a mom. I mean, what was, where were you? So you were, you know, done with your training, what was it like being pregnant and then having this NICU baby and a newborn while being a physician? Pregnancy was rough while working. Um, I was very sensitive to smells. So at some point, at some point in time, I just started wearing a mask funny enough, because that's what my norm now, but I started wearing surgical masks every now. day. I know, isn't that nuts? Um, just to block out smells. Like I would be doing a pap smear and I would get this 
overwhelming urge to throw up. And obviously, to no offense to the patient, it was just me. And I was too early to really announce that I was pregnant. Uh. And so it was just one of those things that um, it, the fatigue was on another level. I, and you had mentioned people training in pregnancy. And I I was already fatigued in, in residency. This was a whole another level. Um, it, it was it was pretty incredible. Um, now, having a NICU baby was, again, a whole different experience. Um, I basically pressured my OB-GYN to let me go in less than 24 hours. <laughs> I did hospital. the same thing. We're so terrible. <laughs> Doctors are the worst patients. We're like, I'm leaving. Okay. I okay. Like, good. There's no way I can get rest here. My baby is here. I want to go see her. Please discharge me. I promise I'm fine. I've pooped. I've peed. I'm, I'm like pain-free. I'm good. <laughs> and so I literally went home less than 24 hours giving birth, changed and went right back to the hospital. And that was my life for two weeks straight until Gia gained enough weight to come home. Thankfully, Sanjay, my husband was a fellow at the hospital that we delivered at. And um, because he takes care, as, uh, takes care of babies in the NICU, he would go visit Gia on the days oh. that he was on call and just hold her. And so that made me feel a lot more comforted that knowing that my husband, who's medically trained, <laughs> next to my child. Um, and then I went back to work in eight weeks. And the only reason I decided eight weeks is because Gia was in the NICU for six or for two of those weeks. So I just added the extra two weeks to my six week plan. And you know what, Natalie, I kind of bounced back and I was fine. I had given birth, went through a rough pregnancy, delivery, NICU baby, that whole thing. And I'm like, I got this. I still need to build my practice. I still need to grow my practice, my patient panel. Um, And I'm super mom. I got this. And I was the only, we had help and we were so grateful for that. But I think with the trauma of the pregnancy and the delivery, I just never really acknowledged it till much later. So you were I like went over the hump. I have a baby home. Now I got to get back to work. Yeah. What, yeah. what year of like being out of church, your practice were you when you had her? How oh, you I know? was less than a year. <laughs> I, so I hear this all the time. And so I'll ask because people are always like, well, I want to wait till I'm done with training. And I'm like, man, that first year out of practice, I mean like the first year of trying to establish yourself in a practice, that's truly the hardest year of your life. I mean, training is hard because yeah. you have no control over things and there's right. certain things you have to do, even if it doesn't fit in, that you have more freedom in private practice or in any type of practice, but trying to establish yourself in a community and grow a practice and you've worked so hard to do it that first year, it's, it's really like you you have to show yourself in that year because people are going to mm-hmm. get to know you and trust you and love you. And then you're set. Or they're going to be like, oh, you've been here for a couple of years and I haven't heard of you. Who are you? Yeah. So it's like you have this yeah. narrow moment to make that first impression. And I was shocked because that, that year was so much harder than I anticipated it. So I am like very- But impressed. nobody tells us these things. Nobody right? does. And so in hindsight, and so somebody be like- that's why I moved forward. You're just yeah. like, okay, I got it. Yeah. But that's like the natural thing is I think we're so focused. And this is medicine, right? You're like college- mm-hmm medical school, Mm -hmm. residency, you know, and you're just checking boxes, like Mm -hmm. contingently waiting for the next thing. And then suddenly there's nothing else to wait for. And you're like, holy cow, this is it. Now I got to really put all this hard work into making this grow. And so I think you actually had your kids in a much harder time. I mean, mine acknowledging was the fellowship is the best time. If you pick a, if you pick a pathway that gives you a fellowship, there is just, you're at a different level and you've already proven yourself. And most fellowships have research time. And so Mm -hmm. I was able to be on research when I had my kids. And so that was really, really great. The thing I think that got me, and maybe, maybe you'll feel this way or not. I felt like I can definitely be a fellow and be pregnant because man, I was a resident. I did those, you know, hundred hour work weeks and I'd be on call for 36 hours the fatigue of pregnancy or newborn, like, I mean, no big deal for me. And I think I like oversold myself that I'd already survived X. And so I could do Y. Mm-hmm. And then I was, I still remember the first night, like being on call and I saw Campbell sleeping in my room and my pager went off and I had to go to the OR to do an ectopic in the middle of the night, but the pager woke up Campbell, of course. And so I'm like, yeah. oh my gosh, that was really bad plan. So now I have to be like, Jason, here you go. Here's Campbell. I got to go. <laughs> Bye. I'll pump in the car. I don't know if there's no, figure it out. Goodbye. You know, oh, 
Yeah. It's There's just crazy. so many things to juggle, so many things to juggle. And for me, what had happened is I went back full force that postpartum depression hit me much later, or maybe I was depressed and anxious the entire time. And I just kind of pushed it aside because that's what we do, right? As moms yeah. and as physicians, we just move forward to the next task. And so I think that delayed my desire to want to try for another, because according to my timeline, I'm saying this in quotes, um, you know, we were supposed to start trying because so, so Gia and the next baby would be about two to three years apart because that's the most ideal says who I have no idea, but that was um, the plan. And we're planners. That was the plan. Yeah. That was a plan mentally and, and written. <laughs> so what, so did you start trying for baby number two at that time period or you kept waiting? No. No, I, 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 we waited. I, at that point in time, I mentally just wasn't myself. Um, and my husband and I had a very uh, deep conversation that bringing another human life into this, uh, balancing a, a commute and two full-time jobs and then two kids is just not going to be good for me. But then when Gia was um, three, we started rediscussing. And that's when, you know, after six to seven months of trying to conceive, my red flags kind of went off and um, I'm like, nothing's happening. This is not like it was the first time. And I was, the first time I went to an IVF doctor, I was just shy of turning 34. So I was still relatively young and I had no reason, again, no reason to, to have uh, fertility problems. And well, so you were in this mindset and I hear this all the time from patients. I stopped my pill. I got pregnant months mm-hmm. later. And so now I want my kids. I don't want them super far apart. However, I got pregnant so fast the time before. So I'm definitely not going to start trying until I'm really ready to be pregnant because I know how that goes. Mm -hmm. So you probably, and it sounds like you did, purposefully waited a little Mm -hmm. longer, anticipating, I mean, naively, but appropriately based on your prior experience, that you get pregnant in a few months or similar to before, and it didn't happen. Yet all the parts kind of seem to be fine. You're having your periods, you're ovulating, Mm -hmm. you're timing sex, all those things are Mm -hmm. just fine. And When you went in, you know, they probably said the word secondary infertility to you. Like, what did you even know that existed beforehand? I mean, maybe, but maybe not. Isn't that crazy? So actually I had a very, um, unfortunate first interaction with, with an IVF doctor. And I was told I was too young and that all I needed was a weekend away with my husband and a bottle of wine. Oh, screw that person. Yeah. I obviously didn't go back to her, but, but you know what though, in that time period, we were stressed. (laughs) I mean, my husband was in a grueling fellowship. He's, his call was crazy. He was the only fellow doing intervention. I, I, we barely had time to have sex, let alone, you know, it was just a lot to take. So a part of me was like, you know, maybe she's right. And maybe we do need a weekend away. And we did that and still nothing happened. So I went to a different IVF doctor and that's when, um, thankfully, uh, you know, she was a little more aggressive. Her red flags went up and she's like, it sounds like you have secondary infertility. We need to sort of work up ASAP and we need to figure out what to do next. Let's, let's do this. So yeah, that's what we did. Okay. So a couple of things. One, it probably felt you know, like the whole, your friend is saying, oh, just relax or just do this and you'll get pregnant yet coming from an REI. I mean, that is To Mm -hmm. me, that would kind of burn me in a way saying, oh, you think that we haven't tried that or, you know, you're just Mm -hmm. blaming me for this problem. You're not Mm -hmm. even acknowledging the existence of the real problem. So I think that's completely unprofessional behavior. Even of course you're stressed. Anytime you have a baby and you're in training, you're stressed. Right. Right. Um, And then the second to me is just this whole kind of idea of being so young, right? That you're too young to have this problem or you're, and when in my, my, you know, REI brain, I'm like, you are young, you should be pregnant by now. Like, why are you not pregnant? Because you're young, you've proven that you can get pregnant and there's competency with eggs and sperm and everything. Mm -hmm. So you should be pregnant now. Like this is more alarming to me because of your youth versus if you are older, Mm -hmm. it's, oh, you've got genetically abnormal egg qualities down, you're older. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that is so hard to get dismissed one from, oh, you're too stressed. Oh, you're not doing it right. Oh, you're just young. And I hear younger patients and, you know, 34 in the REI world is very young. So it definitely qualifies as young (laughs) to us. Um, But I feel people say that, you know, somebody dismissed me Mm -hmm. because of my age or my situation. And that's just, 
I don't know, you shouldn't have to fight that hard to advocate for your care, but it should also validate if anybody's listening that you are not married to a fertility clinic, like leave if it's Mm -hmm. not the right relationship for you. Absolutely. hundred percent. And I say that regardless of, of infertility, I say that to my patients, look, if this is not a great connection, you as a patient have every right to advocate for yourself and find a, a clinician who, who truly believes in you, advocates for you and, and cares for you. I think that's so important across the field. So tell me about the workup. So you hear this word secondary infertility, you're like, what on earth? I mean, you probably partially knew something was going on yet. You don't really want to believe that something's going on. Did your workup reveal anything or did you fall into the secondary unexplained category? What happened? So I had a blocked fallopian tube um, on my HSG and it was explained to me that, you know, it could have been the potential cause, maybe not. I'm still ovulating out of a one. So it's kind of like everyone kind of shrugged their shoulders. Um, My AMH levels were borderline low, but not crazy, impossible. (laughs) So it was a lot of borderline things. Um, And in the end, it was more like, well, regardless of the reason, so far, we haven't found a reason that we could potentially fix, go back. So let's move forward with IVF because that's going to give you your best chances. And at that point in time, that's all we wanted. We were like, I just want to move straight to something that will increase my chance to, to, have a baby and and, and get that product out. And then that's all we wanted. And then we were just almost at that point obsessed, you know, that, that cycle. Yeah. So goal. I I want a baby. Yes. I want a baby and and let me know what I need to do to get it. That's it. (laughs) So, I mean, that is honestly, you know, I'm glad to hear you didn't spend like lots of time in IUI land with one fallopian tube and this and that, because I actually Mm -hmm. find that that happens to a lot of people under the premise of, well, egg and sperm can meet in your body. So let's stay, let's, yeah. let's not do anything different. Let's let it happen there for a while. And they lead it into IVF and even a bigger deficit. So it sounds like at least you were with somebody who aggressively, you know, did a workup. This is also really common and it drives patients nuts because people want problem solution. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. You have X, so you need Y, but very rarely in our field, is it that clean? You know, is it, oh, here's your problem. And when it is, the solution's almost always IVF. Oh, the sperm is low. Do IVF. Oh, a tube is blocked. Do IVF. Oh, you're running out of eggs. We should consider being more aggressive and doing IVF. Oh, you're getting older. We need genetic (laughs) testing. Do IVF. So people Mm -hmm. expect that this workup's going to come out and I'm going to have, okay, hey, so this is the problem. And now we're going to take this pill or use this thing or Mm -hmm. whatever to fix it. But very rarely is that the case. You know, most of the time things are just kind of abnormal. There's no true explanation for what's going on, which I also find is like a mental mind game too, because you're like, well, what is it then? Why is it not working? And I usually use this and your doctor may not have said this may not be the case, but I often say, Hey, this isn't a 0% chance of getting pregnant. But if I tell you with all this data that it's a less than 5% chance per month, it probably was always this. You just got lucky. You you hit the 5% with Gia. It just happened so yes. quick. We were so unexpected to have it now because we didn't know. But in hindsight, with all this data, it's not like you were fine and now something's wrong. It's more like you have the same underlying like low prevalence. You just fell into the mm-hmm. good luck, the stars aligned, God worked, whatever you want to believe in that area. Right. But 5% is not zero. That means some, it happens to some people and even you know the same person. And I find that that mindset helps a lot of people because very often mm-hmm. it's, they're thinking, I was fine and now I'm not fine, yet really nothing has happened in the interim. How kind of what was your take on that feeling? There was so being in the being in the primary care field, I, I do tend to counsel and do initial workups for patients who are having trouble getting pregnant. Um, I like to get the ball rolling. I like to be proactive. Um, and this was before I myself was diagnosed with secondary infertility. So I knew the stats. I I, I just didn't apply them to me. So yeah. you're right. There was a huge mental block. Um, and there was a lot of... And again, you, you counsel patients a certain way. Like sometimes there just isn't a reason, but let's be proactive and let's figure out a treatment plan. But I didn't say that to myself. And I just was like, there, what did I do wrong? Why there was a lot of internal guilt and playing the blame game. Why did I wait? Why did I have postpartum depression? 
Why did I delay? Why couldn't I deliver for my child and for my husband and for my family? Um, and it took me a long time to get over the guilt to the point where I literally have to say to myself, you do not regret your 20s. I don't regret that whole decade of my decade of my life where I decided to devote myself to medicine, where I met my husband, where I went to medical school, moved, started residency, started an internal medicine practice. I don't regret any of that. And this is not a test that I studied for. And I didn't fail. You know, I didn't fail. My doctor didn't fail. We all did everything that we needed to do to increase my chance of getting pregnant. And it didn't happen. And so kind of removing that guilt really changed my mind frame and mindset kind of going into the multiple rounds of IVF. I find that perspective so refreshing because I think it's infertility, women's health issues in general, women bear the brunt of the infertility emotional burden so often. It just is what it is. And what I tell patients is that if this was, you know, thyroid disease, you would not be blaming yourself for your thyroid disease. We wouldn't even give it a second thought. We wouldn't even talk about it. We would talk about Synthroid and the treatment and maybe your other diet and do you have antibodies and what caused it? And maybe we know, and maybe we don't, but we would spend zero time saying, why me? What did I do wrong? What should I have done different? Blaming yourself, which I see happen so often. And I always say, you know, this is a disease. It's a disease for a reason. You don't need to blame yourself for having a disease. It just, it stinks. But on the same breath, I will also tell people that I view life as having four resources in the infertility world. You have your time, your money, you have your physical body, what you can go through physically, and you have what you can go through emotionally. And when you're out of any of them, you're going to be done. Even if I look at you and say, keep going, you can have a baby. Like I believe we can get to the end goal. If you're out of time, money, physical, or emotional reserves, you're going to look at me and say, no. So I look at trying to balance how each person is measuring these. And the hardest one, and studies have shown us too, is, de- is depression or mental exhaustion. Like that yeah. aspect of infertility is the number one reason for patient dropout, even when they still have you know, cycles covered by insurance, even when they still have embryos, mm-hmm. even when they're still young and they have eggs and other things, mm-hmm. is at some point, the emotional burden of the process becomes too great for what you decide you want to put mm-hmm. yourself through. And I see this happen even more in secondary infertility. And you mm-hmm. and I have talked about this because it's it's a different place. And, and I've heard people say this too. You're not really infertile and fertile. There's infertile people <laughs> who are struggling to have one child and they look at you and there's this almost, aren't you thankful for what you have aspect of things? So you Mm -hmm. don't really fit into their group. Yet you don't really fit into the fertile, fertile group because your friends are on baby number two or three and they're getting pregnant like it's no big deal and you're seeing Mm -hmm. siblings happen. So you don't fit there either. So you're really stuck in the middle where you don't really fit into either place and it, it, I find that the emotional burden of that zone is even higher because it's one thing to say, I'm going to do whatever it takes to have a baby. It's another thing to start mm-hmm. feeling like I'm, I'm losing myself in the process and that's pulling me away from being mom to the baby I already have. And how do you relate to those feelings that other people of secondary infertility have expressed? Yeah, I, it, it, yeah, I think you hit everything kind of on the dot there. So um, after my first IVF round uh, that was unsuccessful, um, I looked at my husband and I'm like, I don't recognize myself. I don't know who I am, what I'm feeling. I feel like I've lost my relationship to you, to my daughter, to my patients. I'm just like in this surreal IVF land where I I was just so overly hyper-focused on having a baby. And then I was hit with not. (laughs) And so I took a break. I I told my doctor, you know, I'm going to wait a month or two and just really gain some clarity. And that's exactly what I did. So I I felt all those feelings that you were describing. Um, I didn't know who to turn to how to turn to who, what what resources did I have? I I just didn't know. And so I did a lot of self-reflection and acknowledging my emotions. I mean, it's okay to have anger and 
like crazy envy over the people that were getting pregnant who didn't need to get pregnant or, you know, shouldn't be getting pregnant or all these like, you know, quotes that you hear, um, and acknowledge that my feelings were real, that, you know, the hormones that I was swallowing, injecting and shoving up my vagina exacerbated those feelings and it's okay to feel it, self-reflect on why, and then move forward, not to really let it bog your mindset down. Um, and then I, that's when I actually opened up my social media account. Um, thank you actually to your podcast, um, where, when I started listening to it and that was such a good cathartic release where I showed vulnerability and I really opened myself up to educating others over social media and in person. So, you know, the unsolicited advice that strangers and patients and family members will give you, I would really reply with a lot of anger, <laughs> but, good, good. <laughs> but, you know, I, I changed my response and, in, in, in more of a empathetic educational tone. Like, look, if you're not ready for this conversation, maybe you shouldn't ask me uh, uh, such a deeply personal question about family planning. Um, and I found showing vulnerability was really a source of strength and resilience yeah. and I courage. And that journey, the whole journey really takes all of that. So why not show it and showcase that? So yeah, I, I really did feel a lot of that and, and really had to switch myself over during that break to get myself ready for, you know, the subsequent rounds of cancers. So, yeah. Finding that community or at least that place where you could express mm-hmm. some of these feelings and be honest and open and then find that support from, you know, strangers who become friends, honestly. Right. <laughs> but it's true that sometimes, I mean, that's one of the beautiful things I think about social media sometimes is you can say something and, so, and make connect with somebody in such a way that they mm-hmm. even you become friends or it, they make a different decision mm-hmm. because of it. And that's so powerful. So let's kind of march through your treatment. So here you are, baby number one, no big deal. Three months off pills, you have Gia. Okay, we're waiting. Then months, 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 ovulating, tracking, nothing. Go in, get a workup. We don't really have a great reason, but let's be aggressive, do IVF. You do a round of IVF and it failed. And I always talk about this. Well, what does failed mean? Does that mean you got no eggs? You had no embryos. You had no normal embryos. You had a negative transfer. Did you do a fresh transfer, a frozen transfer? And that's people will say, well, did IVF work? And you're like, well, what, what, what is the metric, right? It's, it's like a paper. Yeah. Well, what, what is the primary outcome that we're judging this by, right? So right. when you went through your cycle, did you, did you do a fresh transfer? Did you do frozen? Did you do genetic testing? Kind of what was the basics, at least that first cycle? So after the retrieval, um, we did a frozen embryo transfer, um, g- genetic testing and all of that good stuff before the, the transfer. Um, and there was no reason for the unsuccessful transfer. Everything was still fine. My doctor said, all right, I'm shocked. You need to be pregnant. We are going to figure out if there's something else going on. So my second, I call it a cycle because I still had to go through all the, 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 the medications, um, we did a mock cycle for an ERA, which is a, I think you can speak more to this, but an endometrial receptor assay. And we found out from that mock cycle that my receptors were actually best at like, I think Day 106 seven hours yeah. compared to 120 hours. Yeah. And so we modified that third round um, to have the transfer at 106 hours um, after the progesterone and um, thankfully I got pregnant, but I miscarried at around uh, six weeks and change. And let me tell you, Natalie, I, I was shattered, broken. I mean, I was in a definitely a, a better mindset, a better zone, but when you hear the words, you're pregnant, you know, I was cautious. Obviously I was early. I knew the stats. I, I, I knew my chances, but you can't help but daydream. You know, oh, your especially when you've gone through and IVF siblings. and you've oh, done genetic yeah. testing and you know the moment you conceived and you know when that due date is, like that baby enters your family. I don't, I always say from the moment it's transferred, even when the transfer doesn't work, yes. it's, a, it's a true loss. But even when you're miscarrying and it it happens so much less with genetically normal embryos that it, it almost hurts more because we're less prepared. Yeah. You know, we're kind of cautious for these 
untested or these spontaneous conceptions and we tell ourselves, okay, one out of four, one out of four, Mm -hmm. but with the genetically tested normal ones, the rate's so much lower that it really is like a bigger punch into our gut when it really happens. Absolutely. You're, you're so right. So when I started bleeding when I was at work, of course, um, you know, going back to my first pregnancy, I'm like, okay, this has happened before. Maybe it's the same thing. I was just trying to grab onto anything. Obviously, I went straight to my REI. Um, They did an ultrasound. It was a little too early to tell, but they're like, things look good. But she looked me dead in the eye. She was like, Laura, you, I know you, I am you. You need to get some breasts. You need to take it easy. I know you're, you know, full-time physician. You have a full practice, this and that, but you've invested way too much time, emotion, and money in this. Please take this seriously. As... Any physician, I have a lot of pride. <laughs> yeah, so we're the worst patients. We're the worst. Oh, it's awful. But, you know, I, I took her words to heart that day in the parking lot with, I mean, I was bawling. I called my manager. I'm like, okay, effective now. I'm taking four weeks off. Cancel everybody. Uh, you know, this is, and at that time, not very many people knew what I was going through still, you know, nine, 10 months later. Um, And so I was, I put myself on bed rest, essentially. It was a little overkill, but I'm like, I'm going to do everything possible to make sure I I increase my chances. And then a week later from my follow-up ultrasound, nothing. It was, it was an empty sack. And Weirdly, again, I think I had a mental block. I knew it. I saw it. I, I I know what that was. Ultrasound technician, you know, brows furrowed, still looking and searching. And I'm like, girl, I don't know what you're looking for. I, there's nothing there. I don't see anything. At that point, it was six and a half ish weeks, and um, yeah, it, it was it was devastating for all the reasons that that you had mentioned. But in the end, I, I still kept my 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 break. I still took the the four weeks off given. Good. There was just so much loss involved that I just don't think I had really given myself some time to grieve. So, you know, I, I think the answer to pause or to continue or to stop IVF completely really just, it, it comes from within. There's no right answer. But when my husband and I, you know, brought up the conversation again, we kind of looked at each other and we're like, I miss you. And Gia is now looking at me and calling me sick mommy because between transfers and injections and all this, like she in my, in her head said, I can't touch her. And that was just, oh gosh, it it broke my heart even more so than, than the actual miscarriage. So, you know, I said to Sanjay, my husband, I was like, what am I chasing? I, I, I have everything that I really wanted right in front of me. I've been given all of these gifts. So why, why am I not taking advantage of this? Why am I chasing this idea? And we really truly did give it a good try, but I think it was healthy for us to have kind of an endpoint um, without being on this endless IVF hamster wheel that I was on that a lot of patients do get on, which is okay. But I think it's important to kind of take pauses and truly self-reflect. Like, is this truly in my gut what I need and what I want compared to what I have. And, and given all of those, it, it really brought clarity to, to me and my husband that, you know what, we're good. We're, we're, we're going to hang out for a while. And you know what? Never say never. Yeah. I still have embryos that are frozen and waiting, but here I am, you know, almost a year and a half later. And, and we're still so happy. And we, we've, I always tell patients and and other people who reach out to me that, you know, we went through our storm, we didn't get our rainbow, but gosh, we found so much peace with our little beautiful family of three and, and letting go of a lot of those emotions and guilt, I think help us bring a little bit of peace to what, to what we have. You found your clear sky, maybe even if it wasn't a rainbow. Oh, I love that. Yes. I think that a couple of things here that are so important and one is not to lose yourself in the process, which sounds Mm -hmm. intuitive, but is so hard, especially not just for physicians, but for any goal-oriented woman in general, you're going to say, I, this is how my life has gone. I make a plan. I do the things I'm supposed to do Mm -hmm. and I get the outcome that I expect. And so why, if I apply the exact same thing and I make calendars and I take the shots and I obsess over it and I (laughs) eat all the pineapple and I do all the things, like why is it not happening? Because I'm doing the things that you truly do lose part of who you actually are in the obsession of 
achieving the goal. And so Mm -hmm. trying to find out how not to lose yourself. And that's different for every single person. And I tell people when we start struggling, Mm -hmm. are you ready to give up? And if somebody says no, I say, okay, good. But you, you are losing you. How do we find you in this journey? What do Mm -hmm. you need to do? Do you need a break? Do we need, you know, Mm -hmm. what, what kind of thing can we do? Do we need a different type of cycle type? Maybe the hormones will be different. What can we do to help you not lose you? Because we don't achieve anything if you're such a different person on the other side of this, you don't recognize yourself anymore. And if it's because you don't recognize yourself for immense personal growth, well, that's fine. But if it's because you're in a depression because it's so Mm -hmm. terrible, I don't have a crystal ball. There are people who I look at and say, you should leave here with a baby who don't, you know? And then I have other, the other end of the spectrum, I have miracle babies that I never thought, you know, maybe would come to fruition and they did. And so there's a lot of this that we are trying our best and we get more data with each cycle and we learn more about people. And there are good studies showing that the more you keep going, the higher the odds are that you'll actually end with said baby, but that's not the right thing for everybody. The other thing I hear, and you can speak to this and I want you to, and people say, well, I feel like I'm quitting. Like I'm a failure if I give up because I set this goal and now I'm not going to achieve it. Or I'm going to now say, I'm going to prioritize me as a person over the goal. And they feel so much guilt over that, or that they're also losing some of their community, this group of people who's been their support. And by saying, Hey, I'm going to tap out. Like we're actually okay now that you now don't fit into that little club that you had just found in the middle, you know? And so they feel like, and why on earth should you feel guilty for be having good insight and saying, this isn't right for me and I want to quit it. And now I'm going to do what's serving us best and focus on our family of three and love on our daughter and grow our practice and just live life and be happy. Why should that carry any guilt? But I really often hear that there's some guilt with feeling like you're failing or quitting or mm-hmm. leaving this pathway behind because for so many people, it's just a train. I mean, how do you feel about that? Yeah, um, it's so funny that you mentioned the 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 community that you were a part of. You're right. I, I was actually going through IVF with along with uh, many people who I'd met over social media, and um, they went on to have their babies. I stopped, and I, I did feel a, a sense of disconnection. Even though we're all on the same boat, we're all you know in this together. It was just like I could have been that, but I'm not because of the decision I made. But then I also go back to kind of my, my focus and, and my, my verbiage change. So I have moved away from saying failing or failed cycle, because like I said, it's not something that I did incorrectly or my doctor did incorrectly. I usually stick to the word unsuccessful and it just makes me feel a little bit better. Um, and then I also changed my focus, um, to, to gratitude. Um, yes, I made the conscious decision to stop and yes, it had some certain repercussions and feelings. Um, I acknowledged them. I self-reflected on why, and then I moved forward because at that point in time, and it continues to be that way that we're, we're okay. And I I don't want to say that things still don't sting. It still does. Right. When someone says, you know, they got pregnant with their third or fourth child, or they had their miracle baby. And I, it's still, I'm still like, well, well, that kind of sucks for me. (laughs) But again, I just kind of go back to, you know, my, my core here and say, look on the day-to-day basis, I'm not hurting. And that says a lot about my decision or our decision Um, And I focus on gratitude. I live in the present because for two years, Natalie, I I froze everything, literally, including my embryos. I mean, I I stopped. froze your life, right? Everything, everything to pursue this. And not saying I regret it because I wouldn't have gone through the changes that I have mentally and, and do everything that I've done so far. But it was just one of those things that I don't ever if we do decide to do this again in the future, I, I, my mindset is going to be in a completely different, even better, I hope, zone um, where I can just focus on gratitude. I have my health. I have my family. I have my daughter. I have a great career. Um, and I'm continuing to find my purpose and focus. And I mean, really, I, th- there's so much more in addition to having a family and um, really not tying my identity to that. Oh, that's so powerful. And I really hope that people kind of hear that and can take that in. There's no right path for everybody. And it's okay at any time of the journey to say, I'm 
I'm not going to proceed forward. That's not what's best for me. I'm going to take a break. I don't know what the future holds. Isn't that powerful to say, I don't know what the future holds. I'm not going to, to be obsessed over the plan. I'm just going to live in the moment and enjoy it. And we do have, you know, frozen embryos. And if we choose to Mm reenter the world, we'll do it differently and we'll be ready for it. And maybe we won't, and that will be fine too. So I think that's such a powerful statement, just releasing yourself from always having to achieve goals and instead just saying, we're going to live and enjoy and be happy, right? Focus on you and focus on your family. I want to end by, I want you to give two pieces of advice. So the first one is to the younger you who is either a med student or a resident or contemplating going into medicine. And we probably just scared them some by talking about (laughs) motherhood and medicine and there's no perfect time. But I I truly believe there is no perfect time ever, ever. It's never going to be easy. You don't know what your journey is going to look like. So you just have to, at some point, accept the fact that you will move forward with it when it's right for you. And the consequence of that will be fine. You will deal with it. Well, what advice do you have to give to that person who maybe hears this and is like, gosh, I don't know if I want to do that specialty or go into medicine because that's kind of scary to me. Yeah. Look, I I tell a lot of people this, that medicine, motherhood, it's a calling. Callings aren't easy. Otherwise it wouldn't be a calling, right? to, To get to a certain part of your life, there are going to be obstacles, but man, when you get there, it's, so incredible. So really listen to your calling, go for it. Don't listen to your fears because if we all listen to our fears, I don't think we would have achieved anything quite honestly. I totally, I love that. Callings aren't easy. I'm going to steal that and put it places. (laughs) I'll I'll credit you, but I really like it. The other thing I want to say is to the woman, the person struggling with secondary infertility, who feels like she doesn't fit into any of the groups, she's not infertile, she's not fertile, and it feels that burden, what do you want to say to her as she's trying to decide what to do? Yeah. um, One, I see you. It's what you are experiencing, what you are feeling is real. And you don't need to be in a club <laughs> to, to acknowledge what you're experiencing, the struggle, the emotional roller coaster, all of the emotions that go along with the ups and downs of infertility, secondary or not. It, there's, there are only so many words that we can describe what we're feeling in, in our journey. And anyone going through infertility really understands the depth of that. So I I really don't want those women to discredit what they're feeling because that is is a whole other level where I I don't think um, they could be successful in in pursuing whatever they want to pursue. So it's really important to acknowledge what you're going through. Oh, I think that's so beautiful too. I want to say a huge thank you for coming on here and being vulnerable again. I know you are in social places and you've shared your story multiple times. And I think it is very inspiring just to have the perspective of, I'm going to focus on what's best for me and my family. And even if that isn't the conventional perfect family or what it's supposed Mm -hmm. to look like or what my plan was or what my goal was. And I really think that that's going to resonate. I mean, it resonates with me, but I think it's going to resonate with so many other people, just that it doesn't have to be all planned out and it is okay Mm -hmm. to switch paths and it's okay to take breaks. And it's okay to say, this is what I need. You know, regardless of what I wanted or what I said, Mm -hmm. this is what I need. So I'm going to do this because that's what's best for me. And I think that is the thing to kind of take away. Flora, will you tell everybody where to find you on social media and other places so that they can find you and follow you and keep getting all this inspiration and then also medical, great medical health information and education that you do as well? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm primarily on Instagram. Um, My handle is at Dr. Dr. Underscore Flo Sinha. Um, And I will be starting a website soon and a lot of good things coming up. So I'm excited to to have hopefully some new followers. Love it. Thank you so, so much. Flora, thank you for spending your time here with all of us. One reason why it was really important to me to have you on is to show everybody that it's not a one size fit all. Life is not one size fit all. It doesn't have to be how you planned. It doesn't have to be how others think that it should be. And it's okay to go down a road and then say, 
I need to make a change. This isn't working and I'm losing myself. To all of you out there, secondary infertility is terrible. It's hard. I mean, infertility in general is really hard. I hear the sentiment that I don't fit into any group really commonly. And I just want you to know that you are not alone. Maybe others aren't talking about it, but you have a community, you have a group, you have us supporting you. To all of you guys, thank you so, so much for all of your love and support of me. You can find me on Instagram at Natalie Crawford MD. You can listen to other podcast episodes. And please check out and subscribe to the YouTube channel. Spending a lot of time there and really love watching the growth of that community. Thanks, friends. My name is Len Webb. And I'm Vincent Williams. We'd like to welcome you to our documentary podcast, The Class of 1989. Over the course of six episodes, Vincent and I will examine the importance of six black films that came out in 89 and how they shape and influence popular culture, filmmaking, and society in general. Come on, sucker. Let's get it on. New episodes will begin running weekly on March 6th. 